This is the Tudor's Dynasty Podcast. And now, Ask the Expert with Steph. Hello, everyone. I'm your Ask the Expert host, Steph Storer. And today I'm joined by the fabulous author and historical researcher, Sylvia Barbara Soberton. Our focus today is the subject of Ms. Soberton's book, The Medical Downfall of the Tudors. Well, this is going to be a really interesting show today because our listeners wrote in with tons of questions. But before we start, I'd love to ask you for a little bit of background. I think for many of us, we assume that the end of the Tudors dynasty came due to Elizabeth I's steadfast or even stubborn decision to not marry or not have children, and therefore she didn't have an heir. But if you think about it, had there never been so many medical issues even leading up to her reign, things could have possibly turned out totally differently, right? So if you want to get us up to speed maybe on what kinds of issues you discuss in your book, that would be kind of a great start with us for us today, I think. Well, I thought it's a great idea for a book because the Tudor dynasty died out because there was no heir of Elizabeth I's body to succeed her. Um, Henry VIII, despite his six marriages, had produced no legitimate son who would live into old age. So I thought that's very interesting. Also, the three of the reigning Tudors, Edward VI, Mary I, and Elizabeth I, died without heirs. Um, and probably the most tragic um, case being that of Mary Tudor, who went through two cases of phantom pregnancy. Um, so I was... I wanted to um, research and get to the bottom of why, why they were unable to um, reproduce because Henry VIII and his wives obviously had um, very, I would say, um, traumatic <laughs> um, history when it comes to children. They, they struggled to conceive, to, uh, to carry infants to terms. Um, and I think it's... There, there are quite a lot of documents shedding light on their their um, reproductive history and medical history. So I wanted to explore that. Let's start then with the patriarch of what we know as the Tudor's dynasty, Henry VII. Some accounts suggest that Henry passed down a genetic disorder that potentially went down the line, maybe even causing the deaths of Henry Fitzroy, um, Edward VI even his own Prince Arthur. Have you ever heard of this? And if you have, what do you think about it? Well, there is this um, theory that Henry VIII had a um, Cal positive blood type, which is a rare, rare thing, um, and that he possibly could have had also MacLeod syndrome. Um, and this theory, is, theory, theory was um, put forward by um, Kira Kramer, and she wrote a book about it. Um, Blood Will Tell, I think it's the title. And she argues that um, Henry VIII's two wives, Catherine of Aragon and Anne Boleyn, um, struggled to um, either conceive or um, carry infants to terms because of this Kel blood positive in Henry VIII. If that was the case, I don't know because it's really difficult to diagnose people who died five, five centuries ago. And so uh, I think this theory is compelling, but I don't think we can say with 100% certainty that that's the case. So I would say this will must remain a speculation and not a, a fact. But it's an interesting theory, yes. It is an interesting theory, and it's, it's actually one that a lot of our listeners brought up and uh, wrote about to us, but it's just one of those things, like a lot of these things where it's, you really can't pinpoint certain things, you know, 500 years later. Exactly. Yes. So then we'll just kind of leave that one on the side then. And we'll know that we can read that other book if we want any more information about Kell's disease or um, those genetic disorders. But I know that another, since we are talking about Henry VIII, another popular discussion uh, regarding his health was about his jousting accident. So I know this isn't necessarily a genetic problem, but it was a medical problem. So we can talk about it here today. Do you know what was his actual injury and how did it affect the rest of his life? Some people are speculating that maybe it went septic and that actually had led to 
potentially why he might have died. But what theories do you have about his leg and what it meant for the rest of his life? So before the accident in 1536, um, Henry VIII was quite fit, handsome, athletic, quite healthy also. Um, and the injuries that he sustained during this his last jousting accident in 1536 marked the rapid decline of his health. The king's legs had a tendency to swell and they were covered in fistulas. Um, in 1538, one of the fistulas closed up and the king remained, remained, it was said, speechless for almost two weeks and it was believed he would die. The royal physicians lanced uh, the fistula with a red-hot poker, allowing the drainage of the humors, the so-called humors, and saving the king's life. And from that point on, the fistulas were kept open for the king's safety, so it was said, producing a stench that could be identified three rooms away. So it was said again. <laughs> and um, one of the courtiers uh, said that Henry VIII was so you know, fat and his leg was so sore that he would one day uh, die because of his leg. And... Um, I think that the pain he was, the amount of pain he was in, and also this, the swelling and the, the, the wounds um, contributed probably to his, to his death. Unfortunately, that description of the stench really got oh. to me. <laughs> I think we're going to move on. <laughs> I think we're going to move on to the women now. Okay, let's go. So, yeah, let's go. Let's go. Let's talk about Anne Boleyn and Catherine of Aragon. So, they both could notoriously not provide Henry VIII with the heirs that he so desperately needed. And it's been said that they were both RH negative. Can you explain to us what this means? And if you can actually confirm that they were. Mm -hmm. So there are, there are two different um, theories. One is a theory that Anne Boleyn was uh, RH neg negative, rhesus negative, which means that her body would reject all rhesus positive fetuses after the first pregnancy causing miscarriages. This would happen if Henry VIII was rhesus positive. And the recent theory, uh, again put forward by Kira Kramer, um, says that Catherine experienced so many stillbirths because, of, because Henry VIII may have had this rare kelp positive blood type which causes miscarriages, stillbirths and neonatal deaths if the mother has Kell negative blood type. Do you have any feelings on any of these theories? Um, as I've said earlier, I think that those theories are um, interesting and compelling. It's definitely interesting to think in terms of modern um, medicine, what could have been wrong with these women, but they died so long ago and it's, it's really impossible to say 100% what really went on and um this must remain a speculation rather than fact but i i found these theories very in interesting another rumor that i've heard pretty frequently actually is that catherine of aragon's nutrition or lack of nutrition could have been a contributing factor in her poor gynecological health well there is this yes theory that in her youth catherine may have suffered from anorexia this is actually based on two pieces of evidence. In 1510, uh, one of the Spanish ambassadors at court recorded that um, there was some irregularity, as he, as, as he put it, in her eating. And that's why um, she didn't menstruate well. And the second piece of evidence is a, um, where Pope Julius II gave Henry VIII the authority to restrain Catherine from excessive religious observances, which included also fasting, because it could it was feared that it could impair Catherine's ability to bear children. Whether Catherine suffered from anorexia in her youth is open to debate. I don't think so. I don't agree with it. She certainly gained weight as she aged, because um, in her later years, ambassadors described her as corpulent, as perhaps even overweight. So I don't think it was anorexia. I think she would have been very caref careful about her diet when she was, uh, especially when she was pregnant, because so much depended on, dependent, uh, depended on the outcome of her pregnancy. Um, so I don't agree with that theory, you know. I think um, also, though, that the poor gynecological health 
if it were kind of an innate thing and not necessarily brought about, brought about by her nutrition, um, then also transferred to her daughter, Mary the first. Do you know what exactly was wrong with Mary? And if you want to maybe go into some of her pregnancies, because how many times was she actually pregnant versus those phantom pregnancies and kind of what was the health issues that she experienced during her reign? Mm -hmm. um, so just, just before I go to, to Mary, I just wanted to clear something up about Catherine of Aragon because it is often stated as fact that she had multiple miscarriages, but her child being history clearly shows that she had still births, not miscarriages. Her children were usually born prematurely and died as infants. So fertility was clearly not Catherine's problem because she conceived on a uh, regular basis. Her problem was that she struggled to carry her children to full term and that her infants died shortly after birth. birth. So out of six recorded pregnancies that Catherine had, there were three children who were still born, two were born alive and who and, and died um, shortly shortly after birth, and one, Princess Mary, and later Queen Mary, she survived. Thank you so much for clearing that up, because I do think that that is something that we all think about. Um, I don't think that people necessarily always realize that she did actually have healthy pregnancies. It was the health of the babies that was the issue. Thank you. And yeah, if you want to maybe go into Mary's health in that perspective as well, that would be um, something that our listeners also wanted to know about. Mm -hmm. So Mary believed herself to have been pregnant twice, first in 1554 and then again in 1557. She took to her chamber in April of 1555 because that first pregnancy was quite a public affair, but no child was born. And by August of 1555, she had just quietly left Hampton Court. Um, according to the Spanish ambassador, she exhibited symptoms of pregnancy because her belly grew, she wasn't menstruating, and her breasts emitted milk. Um, but as soon as became, it became apparent that Mary was not really pregnant, despite showing symptoms of pregnancy, rumors started to spread uh, in England that she was never pregnant at all and that she had a disease that um, distended her stomach. Today, it is widely believed that uh, she experienced a phantom pregnancy, which means that she displayed symptoms but wasn't really pregnant. And phantom pregnancy can be caused by a trauma, either physical or mental, a chemical imbalance of hormones um, and some medical conditions. Also, a strong desire for pregnancy, which Mary had, uh, is among the contributing factors. It has been suggested that she may have suffered from prolactinoma, a tumor on the pituitary gland. It's also possible that the symptoms Mary mistook for pregnancy were the manifestations of the illness that killed her, possibly an ovarian cyst or cancer. Um, it is known that Mary didn't menstruate on a regular basis and that she had um, a manly voice. So this may suggest that she suffered from hormonal imbalance and that was that hormonal imbalance was to blame for her uh, problems to conceive and, you know, having these phantom pregnancies twice. So you do think that the um, cause of her death probably was some sort of gynecological issue, though? I think you mentioned either ovarian or uterine issues? Um, ovarian cyst or ovarian cancer. Yes, I think so, because um, when, she was, when she believed herself to, be, to have been pregnant for the second time, she also displayed symptoms of pregnancy. So her belly grew, and that's highly unusual, unusual in a healthy person who is not pregnant. And so uh, ovarian cyst or ovarian cancer can give a symptom like swollen belly. So I think that may have been her problem. But again, we don't know because nobody really recorded her medical, her health in, in great detail. Although it is known that um, the ambassador of her husband, uh, Philip, her husband wasn't at court at the time when Mary was dying, but uh, he, re he did receive um, uh, regular reports about her health. Unfortunately, unfortunately, these reports are now lost. But 
I do believe that um, he was very interested in um, Mary's health because obviously he wanted to know whether she was pregnant or not. But at the end of her life, it was believed that she wasn't pregnant, that whatever causes the symptoms of pregnancy is not real pregnancy. And now, of course, as we move on to another topic of pregnancy, poor Jane Seymour, right? She find, She's the one who gave Henry his son, and then she was the one who didn't make it. So what happened during her childbirth, and how did that lead to her death? Mm -hmm. So what we do know about Jane Seymour's childbirth experience is that she went into labor on 10 October of 1537, and that her labor dragged for longer than it was anticipated. On 11th of October, a solemn procession went through London to pray for the queen and her unborn baby. And finally, on 12th of October of 1537, she gave birth to Prince Edward. He was healthy. Um, Edward was baptized on 15th of October, but Jane's health started to deteriorate from that point on. And so she grew increasingly weak until on 23rd of October, she had a natural lax, which means that she had a bout of diarrhea and her doctors believed that it was actually a good thing because she, uh, her body was perched and um, they believed that she, wa she would recover from that point on, but she didn't. And she died on 23rd, 24th of October and was buried on, buried on 12th November. Um, and some years after Jane's death, tales started spreading that in order to extract Prince Edward from her belly, a caesarean cut or C-section, caesarean operation was performed. But there is, there is probably no truth to these tales because if she really had a C-section, I think she would have died instantly because of the pain and um, she, would have, she would have probably also bled to death. It's interesting that Thomas Cromwell blamed Jane's death on the neglect of women who attended her during childbirth. And two years later, also um, Christina of Milan, uh, the Duchess who was um, considered a candidate for Henry VIII's uh, wife, said that Jane died because of the lack of care that she received in, um, in the aftermath of, her, of the birth of Prince Edward. Again, we are in the realm of speculation here. We know that Jane certainly died as a result of complications following um, childbirth. But what exactly? There could have been so many things. So many things could go wrong, basically. So it could have been hemorrhage, so heavy bleeding, or perhaps retention of part of the placenta. Either way, she 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 didn't make it. She. She fought very hard, I think, because uh, it lasted basically two weeks, about two weeks. But uh, in the end, she didn't make it, sadly. And of course, their son, their son Edward, lived obviously longer than his mom. But he, uh, most accounts refer to him as a sickly child. And then, of course, he died fairly young. So what can you tell us about Edward's health growing up? That he was a sickly child, I think it's a myth. There is one uh, report by a French ambassador who said that, yes, he was a sickly child, but then the same ambassador corrected himself and said, oh, no, the Edward is a, is a healthy, strong baby. And so there was no record of any serious illnesses uh, when Edward was a small child. But she, he did, as you pointed out, he did die young. However, his disease, uh, his final disease, was um, a combination of so many factors. What killed him? Well, it, there is a letter to the English ambassadors abroad from the Lords of the Privy Council who, who wrote about the uh, post-mortem examination of Edward's body. And they said that the disease of which he died was a disease of the lungs and that the lungs had two great ulcers and that they were putrefied. And so the doctors concluded that he died of consumption, that the, the illness was incurable. And consump consumption was uh, another name for tuberculosis. It's uh, basically an illness when you cough a lot, when you cough blood, and you can be ill for several years before final symptoms emerge. But 
Edward's illness was unusual because he produced not only the symptoms of tuberculosis, but other symptoms as well. And these symptoms were puzzling his doctors because he was um, swollen all over his body. He was uh, losing his hair. His nails turned purple. So these were very unusual symptoms for tuberculosis. And that's why also rumors spread that he was probably poisoned. That's an interesting theory too. Now, uh, moving on to our last topic, we hear so much about the sweating sickness and how fatal it was and how Henry VIII was so paranoid about catching it. And so we know that this is something that we didn't want to catch. We didn't want our loved ones to catch it. But what else do we know about it? What actually was it? And then what were the symptoms besides you sweat and then you die immediately? <laughs> there is. It seems like such a dramatic thing to catch. And how was it transferred? And, uh, you know, what, what kinds of things can you tell us about the sweating sickness? So the sweating sickness was a highly virulent disease that manifested itself in England in a series of epidemics between 1485 and 1551. There is one English physician, John Caius, who described the illness in great detail as having a sudden onset with fever, headache, limb pain, confusion, and profuse sweating. In other more acute cases, um, tachycardia and other cardiac signs also appeared. It was a spread from human to human, although we don't know today what exactly the, the, the sweating sickness was, but some researchers believe that uh, it was um, an early version of a disease called hantavirus pulmonary syndrome. So it's possible, it's likely. And it's really strange that the illness, um, did, is, did, it appeared suddenly in 1485 and it disappeared also, vanished so suddenly in 1551, uh, never to emerge again. But people were obviously also very scared that it would come back. Even Shakespeare wrote about how he was afraid of the sweating sickness returning, but it never did. <laughs> Sure. And so my next question was actually going to be, is there anything similar to it now? But since it really hasn't come back, I, I'm guessing the answer sounds like it's no then. I think it would be a no, although this hantavirus, um, hantavirus, hantavirus pulmonary syndrome, I think it's quite close according to some researchers, but there is no really no, no way of knowing since we don't have a sample of what the sweating sickness really sure. was. Now, I think if we're talking about medicine and illnesses, we're going to have to talk about some of the other epidemics a little bit, right? Um, I think the plague was a bit later than the Tudor dynasty, if I'm not mistaken, but I think they were also touched by the Black Death, I think. So do you know anything about the plague or anything like that? Just kind of before we wrap up the medicine stuff, these big sweeping epidemics, you know, I know that we all love a good virus right <laughs> right now especially right yeah. now so do you know do you know anything about that um yes so um the black death first appeared in the 14th century and it peaked in europe from 1347 to 1351 uh it was one of the devast the most devastating pandemics in human history taking between 75 to 200 million lives throughout the world and it was endemic in europe afterwards, which means that the plague or the Black Death returned ever so often, causing major outbreaks and deaths. And so during the Tudor period, of course, there are letters and documents and papers and wills that are brimming with references to the plague. And Henry VIII obsessively feared catching this disease or any other disease. Uh, and in January of 1518, he uh, issued royal, royal plague reg regulations, and these regulations set out ways in which plague was to be controlled, such as the marking of affected houses, sick individuals denied access to unaffected areas, and basic sanitation uh, measures to be carried out. Uh, Henry did fear the infection so much that whenever there was an outbreak, he moved with his um, most trusted servants several times in an attempt to isolate, isolate himself and his entire household from the source of infection. 
and most famously, Henry VIII postponed the coronation of his third wife, Jane Seymour, because the plague was then raging in London and its suburbs. Um, the original coronation date was set on 29 of September, but in July, the uh, imperial ambassador used to Chapuy wrote quite gleefully that uh, the coronation was cancelled because Jane was still not pregnant, but um, the accounts show that um, there was a team of skilled carpenters working on the Palace of Westminster in preparation for Jane's coronation. So we know that preparations were happening, but the plague was to blame that there was no coronation. But Henry VIII still want, he wanted to crown Jane, and so he rescheduled the coronation for 31st of October. Uh, but then again, the, the rebellion known as the Pilgrimage of Grace happened in October, and also the plague was spreading unstoppably, so Henry put these plans on hold. And also, Jane was very um, unlucky in that respect, because when she was five months pregnant uh, in June of 1537, the plague unfortunately hit again, and she was afraid of catching the disease while pregnant. When she gave birth to Prince Edward in October of 1537, the plague was still raging in London, so the christening ceremony was held privately, and special ordinances were set in motion were set in motion uh, to avoid infection at court. And even the um, noblewoman Margaret Grey, Marchioness of Dorset, uh, who was to be um, the prince's godmother, was banned from entering the royal household, household after two people died in the uh, place that she was staying on her way to Hampton Court Palace. So. I would say that the plague had really a huge impact on, on the Tudors and on how they lived their lives. Well, thank you so much for all of this great information today. Um, before I let you go, I definitely want to shout out to all of our listeners who wrote in with questions. So thank you very much, HRH, The Dowager, Katie Ray, MLM52398, Doug Breeden, Galley Fry Girl 927 Sarah J.S.S.S., Princess of Ailes, Patrick Giovanelli, and Roi Francois. I'm so sorry if I pronounced any of those wrong. Now, Sylvia, before I let you go, I know that you are working on, I know we definitely want everybody to go out and buy the book about um, the medical downfalls of the Tudors for sure. So if you want to tell us a little bit about that. And I know you're also working on something else that's new. Am I right with that? Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah, so my book, Medical Downfall of the Tudors, you can read as paperback or as Kindle. Uh, you can buy it on Amazon. Um, and what I'm working on now is a biography of Gertrude Courtenay, the Marchioness of Exeter. She was, uh, it's, this book is the third volume in my series of the Forgotten Tudor Women. And um, Gertrude is a fascinating indiv individual. Uh, she was a very prominent political player, I would say, at Henry VIII's court for many years. She was a staunch supporter of Catherine of Aragon. She, uh, she hated Anne Boleyn uh, and everything that she stood for. Um, she was involved heavily in Anne Boleyn's downfall and in the rise of Jane Seymour. And uh, she herself escaped probably execution in 1538 when her husband was sent to the scaffold and died for his role in the so-called Exeter conspiracy. So I'm very, very excited to introduce her to the wider old audience because there is no biography of Gertrude. And I think it's a pity because she was a really fascinating um, historical character and a, and a Tudor woman who really is kind of neglected in today's historiography. But there is a lot of material uh, evidence of her life. She wrote letters. She was contacting the imperial ambassador Chapuy. She was plotting. Um, she was involved in so many dangerous <laughs> enterprises, I would say. So yes, I'm very excited to introduce her and to have this book published at some point this year. That's great because this year is almost over. So that means it's going to be soon. Oh, good for you. Well, admittedly, those kinds of stories, these lesser known figures with awesome stories that people don't know about, those are my favorites. So we'll have to have you back to talk about Gertrude. Okay, great. I'm, I'm excited to talk about her as well. 
Oh, good. Well, thanks so much for joining us. Thank you, Sylvia. Thank you so much. Thanks for listening to this episode of the Tudor's Dynasty podcast. You can follow and support the Tudor's Dynasty podcast on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and Patreon at Tudor's Dynasty. 